how are you guys doing tonight? Are you good? Man, I love so much um, our worship leaders here. I, I feel like already God has downloaded so much vision into my heart for 2022. And one of the things that he's, he's just like ingraining in me is that this is not a house of worship. It's a house full of worshipers. And I love that we get to push in and dig into the presence of God. My name's Connor. I'm the pastor here at Young Adults, and I, I know they've asked this uh, just a couple minutes ago, but real quick, I don't have a gift for you, but uh, first time here, just shoot your hand up super quick. Awesome. Hey. Thank you for coming and for checking us out. You guys can take a seat, by the way, but if it's your first time here, uh, you know, we say this often, you don't have to believe everything that we believe to belong, but... I think you've picked like the best night pot potentially ever to, uh, to come to your first young adult service because I think you're going to get to hear just the bare bones heart of who we are and what we believe. And I know it can be intimidating and, and weird uh, walking into a church for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time and there's candles sitting in your seat and you're like, I knew they did some crazy stuff here. Don't worry, we offer sacrifices in the back. You won't see it. I'm kidding, it's Christmas. Don't make those jokes. But no, um, we believe the whole reason we do this, the whole reason we have a building and have lights, the whole reason that we're doing a Christmas service is because we believe that there's actually really, really good news for you. And we believe that this season just kind of encapsulates the message that there is a God and that he is real and that he knows you and that he loves you. And so if this is your first time in church, or your first time in church in a while, we're not going to ask much from you. My only request is that you sit with an open posture, an open mind to the fact that what if the words that I'm about to share with you tonight are true? What would that mean for you? What would it mean to know that there is a God who is real and that knows you and loves you just as you are? And has the potential to radically accept you and give you an identity beyond any type of identity this world and this culture wants to give you an identity that goes deeper than your personhood or sexuality, an identity that is rooted in who God is and what he has done for you. That is available for every single person in this room tonight. I'm getting way ahead of myself. I need to stick to the notes. <laughs> but no, I'm just so thankful. And I'm filled with such gratitude and such expectation for the future. And I don't know why, I, I guess like for the first time in my life, there's just been some like hardship surrounding like this season of Christmas, but it's made me lean in to the promise of what this season really means even more than I ever have before in my life. And when I've leaned into the message and the story and the good news of Jesus, I know that it's true, that it's real that there's peace and that there's joy and that there's, there's just salvation in the news of Jesus. And so tonight, I was telling our team in the back, tonight just feels like an offering of thank you to God. Thank you for everything this year has been. I mean, if you've been a part of young adults for any part of this year, you know that God has done some crazy, some miraculous things within our ministry in 2021. And it's not because of who we are. It's because of who God is. Like, think about this. The, the, we got to meet back together for the first time in 2021. God has provided us opportunity and technology to, to meet in a way where we feel safe and we feel comfortable together. Um, this year, we got to do our first YA baptism service. Think about that. Was there anybody in this room that was baptized here at our YA baptism service? People making proclamations that Jesus is God and that they have moved from death to life. I think about all the amazing things that ha that's happened, like our retreat. Who all went on the retreat up in the mountains? Man, God showed up in some crazy ways. We had a girl that didn't even speak English except Jesus and be radically transformed. We had another girl who had, had back problems her entire life be radically healed. We had people set free from oppression. And, and God has just been moving. And can I tell you with full integrity, and this is not because of some radical plan we have for the new year. It's just because that God is so expansive and so big and so good beyond our wildest imagination that I can say with full integrity that I believe the things that God is doing in our church and in our ministry and in our city and in our age group, we haven't even begun to see the goodness of God. And I believe that 
tonight and in the future, 2022, we're just going to continue to see these glimpses of heaven invading earth and taking space in people's hearts and, and people's mental health and people's relationships and people's brokenness and areas of our city. I honestly believe that in the new year, we're going to see people who we thought were lost causes come to know God. I feel like we're going to see families restored. I feel like we're going to see broken relationships mended because of who Jesus is and the goodness of God. I had no plans of saying any of this, but, but that's what Christmas is about. That God is who he says he is and he loves us so much that he would choose to come. And so over the past two weeks, it's my little transition to get back on track there. Over the past two weeks, we've, uh, we've been in a series to just prepare our minds and prepare our hearts for what this season means. And we kicked it off a couple weeks ago and I talked about how easy it is for us to miss the point of, the, of Christmas, the story of Christmas and the message of Christmas, how our culture and our world can sometimes, with good intention, try to change this season to be a, a celebration of the potential goodness that's inside humanity when it's actually about the goodness of a God who would come and offer himself on our behalf. And last week, Milana talked about so amazingly how sometimes the greatest miracles of God come answered in packages we least expected. And tonight, we're going to end our year and celebrate the goodness of God and the goodness of this season by simply talking about the one and only thing that matters in this world, Jesus. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 1. And you know, I know I told you guys that you could sit down, but just, just for Christmas, I normally don't do this. Could we stand really quick as we read God's Word? This is a little old school. Uh, my pastor used to make us do this growing up, but it's just a way of saying, God, our, your word has like weight and authority in our life. We're going to stand for your word. And so Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, it'll be on the screen. We're going to read the story of Christmas through the eyes and perspective of Matthew. It says this, it says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The title of my message tonight is simply this, God is with you. God is with you. Let's pray and then we can take a seat. Jesus, thank you. I feel like in moments like this where we're just reflecting back on the year and celebrating the good news of what this season means, I sometimes just feel lost for words. And I feel like the only thing that I can just find in my soul is just thank you. And even those words seem insufficient, but God, my prayer is that tonight, through this message and through our worship, that this would just be our attempt at giving you an ounce of the glory that you deserve. Jesus, thank you for what you did for us. Thank you for coming for us. It's in your name we pray, and everybody in this room said, amen. You guys can take your seat. So having a baby, I say that like I had the baby, <laughs> Receiving a child into your home. I don't know, like having a kid with your wife. Uh, it is one of the best things in the world. Don't get me wrong. Having kids has been one of the, like my most favorite things I've ever gotten to do. I'm not only the process of having children, but actually having them. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> Actually having them, getting to see them grow up, getting to see their personalities. Uh, having kids is one of the best and my most favorite things that I've ever had the opportunity to do. However, having a child is also one of the most life-changing, life-altering things 
that will ever happen to you. Think about this for a minute. One moment your life is completely and totally yours, right? Your life is yours. You can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you please, right? Your schedule is yours. If you want to go and hang out with somebody to celebrate their birthday at 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, like I might be doing tomorrow, which is normally I'm well asleep in bed, you can do that because you don't have children um, that you have to worry about. If you want to go to the mountains, if you want to go on vacation and just preemptively plan like a beach vacation, uh, you can do that because your schedule is your own. Your time is your own. If you want to watch Netflix for half of the day, go for it. It's yours. If you want to go to the gym in the middle of the afternoon or super late at night, or if you're one of those morning people that get charged by waking up at five and going to the gym, you can do that because your time is your own, right? Your sleep is your own. In, in any moment before having kids, your sleep is totally your own. Like for me, sleeping in is like 730. I'm like, wow. It's 7.30. I've never slept in this long. Like, it has been so long since I've seen 7.30. Some of you guys are like, 7.30? I sleep in until 10 o'clock. You can do that because... Your time is your own. And, and honestly, one of the ones that's becoming more of a reality in my life is before having kids, your home is your own. Your apartment, your, your room maybe that you rent out. But whatever it is, it is your own. And in a moment, and in what seems to be a blink of an eye, my wife is like, I labored for 16 hours. That is not a blink of an eye. But in a blink of an eye, <laughs> this child comes on the scene. In one moment, your life was your own. and the next moment, nothing is your own. Your schedule now revolves around feedings and nap times. Your time is spent keeping a little alien-looking human alive. Your sleep, ha, 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 you don't sleep. Have fun never sleeping again, right? Like... Your house becomes this wasteland of diapers and wipes and baby dolls that for some reason always lose their clothes and start to like form and look more and more like Chucky. And all around like your floor are these toys scientifically designed to be the perfect thing for a parent to step on and say four letter words like crap. <laughs> your life is, is no longer your own. So who wants to have kids, right? Like... <laughs> I remember uh, when, when we had our first, I'm going to say we had our first, I don't know, it just sounds better, um, but when we had our first kid, I fully recognize, babe, that you had our child, but when we had our first, uh, I remember my wife just went through one of the most insane, you know, potentially traumatic moments of her entire life giving birth, and, and we did it, and we were like, Whew, babe, that's a great job. You did it. The baby is here. It's time to get some sleep, right? And so they wrap our baby and put her in this little wooden thing, like at the foot of our bed, and we're asleep. And she starts to cry. And the nurse comes in, and she's like, hey, your baby's crying. And I remember, you know, like Aaron and I, like, looking at each other, and we're like, yeah, we know. Can you do something about that for us? She's crying, like, what, we don't know what to do. We've never done this before. Can you figure out our baby? And the nurse was like, oh, no. Bless your heart, you know? No, your baby's crying because you need to feed her, both now and for the rest of your life. Like, <laughs> No, your baby's crying because she will need every waking moment of your time and attention now and forever. So you have to deal with it, right? And I remember just sitting there like, this you is now my wife. Like, as a dad, I've kind of done what I could do, and I'm just here. I'm present. I'm the cheerleader. And so I'm like, sorry, babe. You got this, you know? But could you kind of be quiet because I'm going to try to go back to sleep? No, I'm kidding. I did not do that. Maybe I did. But what do you say to your exhausted wife who has just given birth and now it's time to learn this whole new process of feeding, right? Like, hey, you're doing great, babe. I think she's eating, right? Like, I'll just stand here and watch if that doesn't make you too uncomfortable, right? Like, what am I supposed to do? 
But all jokes aside, having a baby, it's one of the greatest things you can ever do in life, but it truly is life-changing. And one of the biggest changes that you make when you bring a child into this world is that no longer are your decisions only for yourself. Like every choice you make not only affects you or not only affects your spouse, it also affects another little human being. And so you have to start thinking uh, in, in a bigger picture outside of things that only affect you. And at first, this is kind of fun, especially before the baby gets here, right? Like, you know you're about to have a baby, and this can kind of be cute, and this can kind of be fun because your decisions at this point don't have a ton of repercussions. It's like, hey, what car seat do I want to have? What stroller? Like, what's the stroller that Kim Kardashian has? Oh, it's like $6,000. Okay, like, on to Target, right? Like, what, what color do we want to paint our nursery? Like, you know, but what, making decisions is fun, but then it starts to get real when it comes to choosing a name. I don't know why, but names are just serious to me. Like, names have, like, a ton of significance. I know that there's trendy names out there. I know that there's traditional names out there. I know that, like, it's really cute to, like, name your kids things that match or, or you know, like, have, like, a theme amongst your children, but for whatever reason, like, I don't know why, maybe it's because I'm more sentimental than my wife, maybe it's because I'm just more emotional than my wife, and she will attest to that, but for me, naming our child, like, having a name to give our child had a ton of weight and a ton of significance. I wanted our child's name to, to have deep meaning that would speak into the person that they would one day become. I wanted our child's name to, to almost be this like prophetic uh, uh, vision for their life. Like I wanted it to have something to do deeply with the person that God has made them to be. My wife, on the other hand, would be like, hey, babe, Taylor Swift just released this new song. I think it'd be perfect for our kid. I'm like, babe, this is the one area that Taylor does not get a say in our life, right? We're not naming our baby Wonderball or whatever that song is. It's not even that good, but I'm just kidding. Mirror ball? Did somebody say mirror ball? Okay, yeah. Whatever. Sorry, Taylor. No say in naming our children, right? But to make a really long story short, um, Aaron and I came together, and we had a couple names we were passionate about, and we decided that we would talk to Jesus and pray about these names, and that maybe God would give us a little guidance. And so I remember one time I took my dog on a walk on our little back path, and I was just praying, and I was like, God, what should we name this kid? What should I name my daughter? What, what, what have you made her to be? Like, how have you stitched her together? What's her personality going to be like? What, what have you called her to do? What are the gifts you've placed in her life? What are the passions you've placed in her heart? God, what should be this baby's name? And I remember distinctly God speaking to me and saying this. He said, hey, your daughter is going to be a rebuilder of broken things in my kingdom. And I could cry like thinking about it. I, he said she's going to be a rebuilder of broken things. She's going to help broken hearted people and protect the truth of my word. She will be a restorer of things in my kingdom. And when I heard that, you just know when you have those moments from God that like affirm everything that you were thinking. And it just let me know and it affirmed in my heart that our daughter, our first daughter's name was going to be Ezra. And Ezra means helper and protector. Now I tell this story. Because in the Bible, names have so much weight and so much significance. A name is ju not just what you call somebody. A name has the potential to be a predictor of their destiny. And so in the Bible, names have meaning. Names have a lot of weight. And all throughout Scripture, we see God revealing himself to people through the names and the titles that he gives himself. For example, one of the first names we have of God is, is the moment where Abraham is called to offer a sacrifice of his son to God. And so he takes his son and, and they walk up Mount Moriah and, and they're getting ready and the son is kind of catching on and he's like, hey dad, uh, what is happening here? Like things are getting a little fishy. Why are you tying up my hands? Like he's going to take his son and offer him as a sacrifice. But then God comes onto the picture and steps in and a ram is caught in a bush. And God says, no, you don't understand. I will actually provide the sacrifice for you. I don't require sacrifices from you because I am the ultimate sacrifice. 
And God provided for Abraham and his son Isaac on that day a sacrifice, which was a picture of what God would provide later on in Jesus. And Abraham met God and saw God in that moment. And God revealed himself to Abraham as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, my provider. Later on in the Bible, this man named Moses is called to liberate the people of Israel out of Egyptian slavery and captivity. And as he's wandering in the desert, this bush is caught on fire and starts speaking to him. Kind of weird, right? But, but God starts speaking to Moses about the ways and the reasons why he wants his people liberated. And Moses, honestly, is a little bit of a coward. And he's like, God, I'm not a very eloquent speaker. I don't know how to speak well. I don't know if I can do this. And in that moment of fear, God reveals himself to Moses and says, Moses, I am who I am. Moses asks God, who, what am I supposed to say? What, who am I supposed to tell this most powerful person in the world, in the known world at this time, who sent me to liberate this people and God reveals himself to Moses as Yahweh I am who I am and he says tell your people tell Pharaoh that I am has sent you to Gideon a farmer who was a coward hiding from the oppression of his people in a wine cellar threshing wheat God calls him to be a warrior and a liberator of his people. And after refusing and asking for signs and gathering an army, God assures his soul that he is called to this. And God reveals himself to Gideon as Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, my peace. And to one of the most famous characters in the entire Bible, King David. This shepherd boy who is anointed and called as king and who's chased around his country by a lunatic king set to murder him for one day taking his throne, this, this shepherd boy who slayed a giant and became one of Israel's greatest kings, a man after God's own heart, pens in one of the most famous psalms that we have. The Lord is my shepherd. He is my Jehovah Ra. All throughout scripture, God reveals himself through names, because in the Bible, names have so much weight and so much significance. But of all the names that God has chosen to reveal himself as, one of my favorite names, probably the most favorite name, probably the most favorite title that God has given himself and revealed himself as, is found tucked away and hidden in the story that we just read in Matthew, the story of Christmas. And we're going to go back just for one second and take a look at this. Matthew 1, 22 and 23, it says, this all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us I love that name Emmanuel I love that name I love the weight and I love the significance that sits behind that name I love that at the revealing of Jesus At the revealing of this newborn baby king, the title, and this is one of the final titles, one of the final names that God reveals himself as uh, pre-Jesus. One of the last names ever given to God, last titles where God shows us his character is his name Emmanuel, given to Jesus, God with us. The God who has become man to dwell with his people. And as we enter into this Christmas season, I honestly believe just two quick thoughts. I believe that there's two major things that this name can reveal to us about who Jesus is. And I believe that if we allow this name and the reality of this name to penetrate our hearts, I believe that at the very least, this has the potential for any believer that's been in this room to remind yourself of the goodness and faithfulness and salvation of God. And for some of you that are in this room and maybe you don't know God or maybe you've never heard this message, I believe that this name can reveal some of the best news you'll ever hear in your entire life. But the first thing that I believe this name Emmanuel reveals to us in this Christmas season is simply this. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. God. He is Emmanuel. He is not a picture of God. He is not a partial revelation of God. He has God come to dwell with his people. The, the announcement of Jesus as Emmanuel is a declaration that this newborn baby, 
born of a virgin in a manger is not just some prophet that will one day give insights and wisdom into the things of God. It's not just, he's not just some teacher with good things or new revolutionary thoughts to challenge the way you've been thinking. He's not just some social or political revolutionary come to overthrow the religious or political system of the day. He is not some salvific, symbolic figure. No, Born in the town of Bethlehem into our world 2,000 some years ago, born into poverty and obscurity, was God himself. Jesus is God. A God who so loves the world that he would humble himself and step into the boundaries of his creation. This name was a declaration that God had become man. And that man's name was Jesus. Paul, later writing to the church of Colossae, says this in Colossians. He says that in Jesus lives all the fullness of God in a human body. The announcement that Jesus is Emmanuel is this announcement that God himself has come, that God has decided, God has chosen not just to to save in, in a distant way, but to be present with his people, that God has made a way to himself through himself for his people. Jesus, as Emmanuel, is is this revelation that Jesus is God. He's not just a good person. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a healer or a miracle worker. He is God in the flesh. And why can I tell you that this is the best news your soul could ever hear? This is why the writers of the gospel say, I have good news for you. Jesus is God. This is good news for all of us. Why? Because if Jesus is God, no longer do we need to wonder what God is like. If Jesus is truly God, then no longer do we need to wonder what God is like. No longer do we need to wonder the temperament of God. No longer do we need to wonder what what his personality is like. When we look at Jesus, we see the fullness of God made man. Jesus is God. No longer do our souls need to search for the kindness of God because when we look to Jesus, we see the kindness of God made flesh. No longer do we need to wander what the grace of God looks like in this world because when we look to Jesus, we see grace incarnate in a human. No longer do we need to wander what the salvation plan of God is because when we look at Jesus, we see his plan of salvation made human unearned and undeserved, but readily available for all who put their faith in him. We no longer need to wonder what God is like because God has come and his name is Jesus. Why this holiday season, as you're sitting with family and you're sitting with friends, as you're unwrapping presents and eating dinner, remember that we're not just celebrating the fact that God has made a way back to him for us. We're celebrating the fact that God has become the way back to him for us. That God so loved you and I that he would come. Jesus is God. The fullest revelation of God made man. And I'm going to be quick because I want to get back to worshiping. I felt like God put it in my soul tonight to just just worship and praise him. And we're going to do the candle thing here in a minute. Um, But my second point, my final point is simply this. And Ben, you guys can make your way on up. Emmanuel reveals to us that Jesus is God. And it reveals to us that God is with us. That Jesus is God. And that God is with us. Listen, I don't know who I'm talking to in this room tonight. But I felt like the point of this whole message was to say this one statement, that God is with you. God is with you. I felt like God put on my heart that there are going to be people in this room who feel like God is distant, that God has abandoned you, that God has forsaken you, that God does not think about you, that God does not spend his time, the Bible says, singing praise over you. God is with you. 
I don't know what season you find yourself in in this room, but I, I honestly believe that the, the revelation of Jesus as Emmanuel is not only that God has come, but God remains with his people. God stays with his people. God is with his people. He is a present God. He has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you. God is with you. Jesus is with you. The message of Christmas is not that we have to draw close to God, but that under no obligation, God has chosen to draw close to us. God is here. Jesus is with you. He's with us. He's the God who is present with the hurting and attentive to the brokenhearted. He's the comforter of the sick and the peace to the anxious mind. Jesus is the God who blesses the poor and welcomes the outcast. He's with you. I'm going to say that again. He's with you. For the person that doesn't feel it right now in this moment, he's with you. Jesus is with you. God is with you. He is with us. He's with his people. He is with his church. You are not left alone to figure out how to do this Jesus following thing on your own. He is with you. He is closer than a brother. He will stay with you. There is nothing you can do that, that would make him leave you or forsake you. There is no sin too great for his grace. There's no decision that you have made that you can't turn away from and walk towards him. God is running towards you. He is with you. He is for you. He's with you. I feel like I just need to say that until somebody actually gets that in their spirit. This isn't song and dance. This isn't a game. This isn't a, I hope my good outweighs my bad. This is the reality that, that under no obligation to us, for no other reason than a radical love that I cannot wrap my, my mind around, God became a man. And he dwelt among us to feel what we feel to experience pain, experience joy, experience love, experience suffering, to know what it's like to have somebody stab you in the back, to know what it's like to walk this earth. He is our ever-present help in time of need. He is with you. He's with you. Jesus is with you in this season. And I know for a lot of us in this room, the holiday season is this mixed bag of of pain and happiness, right? That Christmas can be a time where we're reminded of all the things that we should be grateful for in our life. And it also can be this reminder of all the things that we might have lost both in this year and in our life. It's this mixed bag of pain and joy. But can I tell you that you're not alone? that in the highs and the lows of this season, the coming of Jesus shows us that God was unsatisfied to offer you comfort at a distance, but that he would come and dwell with you and remain with you through his spirit living inside of you. You know, God is with you. Jesus is with us. The story of Christmas is that God is with us. Think about this. He could have done anything God could have done anything to offer salvation to us. God could have done anything to offer a way back to us. He could have doubled down on the law. He could have doubled down on the sacrificial system. He could have told us that we had to do this or we had to offer that or we had to give this up. God could have done anything. But the news of Christmas is that the thing he decided to do was to come and to offer himself a sacrifice on our behalf so the doors of heaven are flung wide open so that the whosoever believes can come and they can draw close to a God who is drawing close to them. This isn't a religion without a relationship. This is the reality that there truly is a creator God who speaks and things come into existence who kneels into the dirt and draws a figure and, and gives his breath and animates life. And this God who gives life doesn't back away, but sustains life and walks with us. He knows your name. He knows how many hairs are on your head. The Bible says that he knit you together in your mother's womb before you were even known. That the number of days on this earth, he knows them from the day you were born to the day you will meet him face to face. And every single day between that moment and then, He is with you. And every high and every low, 
in every wedding and every funeral. He's with you. The story of Christmas is that God came and his name is Jesus and that he's with us. Our Emmanuel, the God who is pleased to dwell among his people. Would you stand with me? I don't know who's in this room tonight. Maybe this is the very first time you've ever heard the news that Jesus is God. And maybe as you stand here, you're kind of wrestling with this reality in your heart. You're trying to come to terms with this. But I believe that every single person who hears this news, that deep within their soul, they they want to believe that it's true. Believe that the kind and generous and gracious, grace, most gracious person on the planet would actually be God in the flesh. Can I tell you that it's true? That Jesus is God. You need not wonder what God is like. You need not wonder what God thinks of you. You need not wonder if God accepts you because when you see Jesus, you see God. I hope that that's news that sets some of you free tonight. And maybe you're in this room and you feel distant from God. Maybe you're going through a situation in your life where you just feel like God is nowhere to be found. If that's you, could you raise your hand? Because I just want to remind you that God is close to you. If you're in here tonight and maybe you've never understood the reality that Jesus is God, I want to pray with you. Could you lift your hand? Nothing crazy. We're just going to speak to God like we're talking to a friend. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. And if you're in here tonight and you need reminded that God is with you. He's not far, but he is close. I want to pray with you too. With every head bowed and eye closed. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for making a way for us through yourself. Thank you for being the way. God, for every single person that lifted their hand that said they want to know this Jesus, this God man who came on their behalf. Would you just say this in your heart with me, Jesus? I want to know you. Help me do that. And for those of us who feel like God is distant or feel like we don't feel the closeness of God, would you remind our souls tonight that you are the God who dwells with his people, that you are here with us now. And it is our joy and our honor to worship and to celebrate you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. It's in your name we pray. And everybody at YA said, amen and amen. Let's worship.